The California gold rush forever altered the lives of Sierra Nevada indigenous people. Within a few years, more than half, and perhaps as much as 90% of all of California's Indians were dead. Victims of disease, but also oppression and violence. The California gold rush brought thousands upon thousands of gold seekers who swept across the landscape like an avalanche. And the official government policy toward the native people became extermination. Arguments for following precedent and removing the Indians to reservations were drowned by sentiments like those expressed by Governor Peter Burnett in his first annual message to the newly created California State Legislature in 1851. Burnett said, quote, that a war of extermination will continue to be waged between the two races until the Indian race becomes extinct must be expected. While we cannot anticipate this result with but painful regret, the inevitable destiny of the Indian race is beyond the power and wisdom of man to avert." Unquote. Public policy supported the barbarous practice. Local governments provided bounties for Indian heads or scalps. At the state level, volunteer militia members submitted claims to the California State Treasury for reimbursement of their expenses in, quote, suppression of Indian hostilities, unquote, and extermination. In 1851 and 1852, the legislature appropriated funds for claims totaling more than $1 million. Eventually, the federal government reimbursed the state government for these ghastly expenditures. It was also open season on the legal rights of Indians. In April 1850, the new California state legislature passed, quote, an act for the government and protection of Indians, unquote. This humane-sounding law was anything but protective. Any Indians were subject to arrest, quote, on the complaint of any resident, if they could not financially support themselves, or if they were, quote, strolling about loitering, or leading an immoral or profligate course of life, unquote. If the government determined that an Indian was, quote-unquote, a vagrant, he or she could be bought within 24 hours from a county or municipal agency at public auction and forced to work for a term not to exceed four months. The 1850 law also provided that a convicted Native person could be bailed out, quote, by any white person, unquote, willing to pay the fine, and that, quote, the Indian shall be compelled to work for the person so bailing until he has discharged or canceled the fine assessed against him." Unquote. Many reports indicate that when an Indian's service was nearing an end, it was not unusual for the overseer to ply him with liquor, have him arrested for public drunkenness, repurchase the Indian at auction, and renew control of the victim. The act stated that, quote, "...in no case shall a white man be convicted of any offense upon the testimony of an Indian." Unquote. A final provision of the act established a system of so-called Indian apprenticeship, under which any white person desiring the labor of an Indian child could appear before a justice of the peace and make a petition for the right of custody. The action required the supposed consent of the child's parents or friends. If the justice agreed, a certificate was issued authorizing, quote, the care, custody, control, and earnings of such minor until he or she obtained the age of majority, unquote. Under the law, whites could obtain the services of any number of Indian males under the age of 18 and females under the age of 15. The only obligation of the master was to treat, feed, and clothe the underage wards properly. Failure to meet that condition resulted in reassignment of the child to another master and a $10 fine. In 1860, the apprenticeship provision was revised to allow children to be placed in a master's custody without parental consent. It was also altered to permit, quote, articles of indenture, unquote, that authorized the white overseer to have control over the Indian charge for a set period of time. Males under 14 could be detained until the age of 25, and males obtained between the ages of 14 and 20 could be controlled until the age of 30. Females could be retained to the age of 25. It is believed that 3,000 Indian children were sold into slavery at between $50 and $200 apiece under California's sanctioned apprentice system. Kidnapping was not unusual. In 1855, the San Francisco newspaper Alta California reported, quote, 
it has been the custom of certain disreputable persons to steal away young Indian boys and girls and carry them to white folks for whatever they could get. In order to do this, they are obliged to kill the parents." Unquote. In 1856, Thomas Hendley, Superintendent of California Indian Affairs, reported to George Manypenny, Federal Commissioner of Indian Affairs, quote, It is proper to say that kidnapping has been carried on to an extraordinary degree. I have undoubted evidence that hundreds of Indians have been stolen and carried into settlements and sold. In some instances, entire tribes were taken en masse. Unquote. Native California girls were often sold or kidnapped and forced into sexual slavery. Kidnappers prized physical beauty, and one Nisanan mother stated that she would deliberately dirty her children's faces to keep them from being kidnapped. Native women were also frequently kidnapped and forced into prostitution. In El Dorado County in 1853, two natives attempting to free their captive wives were shot, one fatally. In 1856, the San Francisco newspaper, The Bulletin, reported that in one mountain reservation, quote, some of the agents and nearly all of the employees were daily and nightly kidnapping the younger portion of the females for the vilest purposes. These wives and daughters were prostituted before the very eyes of their husbands and fathers by these civilized monsters." Unquote. The Act for the Government and Protection of Indians ultimately placed local natives into various forms of slavery or near slavery and remained in effect until 1863 when it was repealed as a result of President Abraham Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation. It is uncertain exactly how many Indians were affected by the original 1850 legislation, but historian Robert Heiser estimates that as many as 10,000 indigenous boys and girls may have been indentured, kidnapped, or sold between 1850 and 1863.